Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Larkin, and I'm honored to be speaking to you today about a condition I'm passionate about diagnosing, hypoactive sexual desire disorder, or HSDD. By way of background as we begin, um, I'm a women's health internist in Cincinnati, Ohio. Over my career, I've practiced in both an academic setting and in private practice. I currently am in private practice and own and direct my own multi-specialty primary care and women's health practice. I'm busy clinically and see patients for both ongoing primary care, men and women, but I also provide consultative women's health care in the areas of menopause, sexual medicine, breast cancer risk assessment, and cancer survivorship. My hope today is to review the assessment and management of a patient with hypoactive sexual desire disorder in the hope of providing you with tools to address this important women's health issue. My hope is by the end of the presentation that even if you don't feel comfortable or have the time in your own practice for a comprehensive evaluation, that you will at least feel more confident about asking about this disorder and making it a, re a referral. My hope is to engage you and get you excited about sexual health because it's such an important women's health issue. So I'll start by just saying that, you know, sexual health is an area of unmet medical need. I have a patient here with me today, Karen, and prior to letting her take this stage, and we're going to do a little role playing, um, and she'll describe her journey with hypoactive sexual dis uh, desire disorder, um, I just want you to understand why this is so important to me and why um, I, I, this has become something that I have really uh, become very dedicated to in practice. Um, sexual health is a clear, well-established, unmet medical need, as has been documented by survey after survey. What we know is that women often suffer in silence for many years and lack access to care of clinicians interested in or trained in sexual health. Certainly as a primary care provider, I know how hard it is in practice and short visits. Um, and primary care providers, in addition to having short visits where sexual health seems very overwhelming, um, primary care providers in general don't have the training to address sexual health issues in their practice, and that's part of the barrier to sexual health needs of women going largely undetected and untreated. One of my goals professionally now is to help raise the standard of care for women in the arena of sexual health. And when I left academics uh, two years ago and reopened my practice, I did it with that goal in mind, and it's one of the reasons now that for sexual health consults, I have 60-minute visits allotted for a new patient. The other thing I did when I left academics is uh, launch a new nonprofit in Cincinnati called the Sexual Health Consortium, Cincinnati Sexual Health Consortium, and that's a nonprofit um, really designed to raise the standard of care in my local community by being a physician collaboration organization. It's open to all providers in the area who are practicing in the arena, in, in the arena of sexual medicine as a way to bringing physicians together to try to improve access for uh, women in Cincinnati with sexual health concerns. So today my hope with this presentation is to um, engage you in the evaluation and management of a woman with a sexual health concern. And I have a patient with me today um, who I'm very happy to have here. Uh, Karen is a relatively new patient of mine, um, and she's going to help us uh, discuss hypoactive sexual desire disorder and her uh, journey to uh, treatment. I also want to make one other point before I turn it over to Karen, um, is that um, sexual dysfunction, female sexual dysfunction, this is not a lifestyle you know, condition. Um, what we know, again, from survey after survey done by my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Cheryl Kingsburg and Dr. Sharon Parrish and others, is that female sexual dysfunction impacts a woman's health. It impacts her quality of life, her self-esteem, self her relationships, and really impacts her overall health. And this is when we look at surveys of women when they rate what's important to them, sexual health really ranks up there in a very high position. We understand from women as well that in terms of their relationship, a good sex life adds value to the relationship of maybe 10 to 15 percent, but a bad sex life negatively impacts the relationship on the order of magnitude of 50 to 70 percent. And so again, um, this is something that's very important to women, and if the goal is to raise the standard of care of women's, and women's health, um, addressing female sexual dysfunction is really important. And so again, before I let Karen take the stage, I just want to focus uh, again to say that what we're talking about today is 
only one of the disorders of female uh, sexual health. Um, it's hypoactive sexual desire disorder, or HSDD. And I want to make sure that we define what uh, hypoactive sexual disorder is as we start with Karen. So hypoactive sexual desire disorder is persistent or recurrent deficiency or absence of sexual thoughts, fantasies, and or desire for sexual activity. And this has to be something that's causing marked personal distress, and that really is a hallmark um, or interpersonal difficulties. It has to be in the setting of not having any other condition that's causing it, so no other medication or medical condition. The other criteria is lack of motivation for sexual activity, which is manifested by either reduced or absent spontaneous desire, so this is when you're not thinking about it and you're not um, initiating it, or reduced or absent responsive desire to erotic cues or stimuli. It also has to be that the avoidance for sexual activity is not due to some other cause, such as sexual pain or anorgasmia. And when we look at studies, and just in terms of, you know, again, helping you understand that this is something that you're seeing, even if you don't know that you're seeing it in practice, because this is so common. So a colleague, Jan Schifrin, did a large survey study of over 30,000 women called the PRESIDE study. And in this study, 10% of the women surveyed have a desire disorder as defined by low desire that's causing distress. And you can see that when we compare it to other categories of female sexual dysfunction, it's the most prevalent. So one in 10 women have hypoactive sexual desire disorder. So this is not a small problem. The other thing to note is that if we look at this slide, um, again, from the PRESIDE study, we see that the majority of women never address this with their healthcare provider. This, again, is back to you know, really there are barriers to women uh, having their sexual health uh, needs addressed. You can see that only 34.5% of women had any kind of discussion with their healthcare provider, which leaves over 65% of women really not having a discussion with their provider, and this is the area where I'm hoping we can engage more clinicians and help break down that barrier. And so with all of that, I would now like to um, ask Karen to um, start the conversation and tell us a little bit about herself. Um, and then we'll go on to really having a role play with her um, so that she can kind of reenact the last uh, two visits that she's had with me um, as a way of illustrating how I evaluate a patient in practice now with hypoactive sexual desire disorder. So, First and foremost, thank you so much, Karen, uh, for coming to join us today and for talking to us about this really important issue, and, and I appreciate you being here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, I'm 45. I'm married. I have three children, ages 20, 16, and 11. Um, we've been happily married for like 23 years. Uh, we have a lot of fun together, spend a lot of time, and he's my best friend. Um, but I guess about two, three years ago, I noticed that I just didn't have any interest in, you know, sex. I didn't want to be intimate at all or anything, and um, I don't know what happened. You know, we went from having sex three to four times a week to down to once or twice, and then, like, you know, once or twice a month. And even when we had, like, a recent vacation, I didn't want to have sex, and it really, really bothered me. You know, my last gynecological appointment last year, um, I actually had to bring it up to my doctor, and she told me I was perimenopausal and this was normal, but um, I felt like she kind of brushed me off, and I know I, I didn't feel like this was normal. So um, I did some investigation on my own and found Dr. Larkin online. Okay, great. Well, thank you for setting the stage there, Karen. Um, I'm going to come back to Karen, but I want to um, talk a little bit about uh, this, what I think is really a helpful and important process of care guideline for clinicians. Um, if you're looking for one resource uh, to, uh, that discusses the evaluation and management of hypoactive sexual desire disorder, I would encourage you to look for this paper. Um, it was published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings in April of this year, um, and I was fortunate enough to be uh, part of the panel um, that worked together for two days to review the, the literature and come up with 
really a working guideline for the evaluate, evaluation and management of hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And we really tailored this publication um, for primary care providers as well as sexual medicine um, experts. And so if there's one um, publication that you're interested in reading, I encourage you to see this publication. As part of this publication, and there are several, I think, good figures in this publication, um, this is the consensus that we came to, which is um, really an evaluation and management algorithm. And although it's probably um, too small to read on your screen in this format, I've broken it down a little bit, and I will reference this as we go along. Um, as being part of this panel and working on this publication, um, this really is the process that I follow in practice. And again, I realize that I have the leisure of having 60-minute visits with new patients. Um, but I hope that this will be helpful um, for all of you listening to kind of follow along with. On this slide, what, I, what I'm showing you is, um, and this was really one of the hallmarks that we worked very hard on in the paper, is really to get to the place of um, wanting to encourage primary care providers who are busy, who ha have very short visits, to really just simply ask about sexual health concerns. And so if you listen to this webinar and the only thing that you become comfortable with um, is trying to figure out where in your um, patient assessment in these 15-minute visits, 10 or 15-minute visits that you have, is how you can incorporate um, just asking about sexual health um, and making a referral if the patient has a sexual health complaint, I think will be a home run. And so really I will tell you, you know, I described to you that I have kind of two arms of my practice. One is my primary care arm, um, and that's where I have men and women, and I'm seeing regular primary care visits. And what I do personally is I really incorporate asking a sexual health question in my review of systems. And really what I say, um, you know, I typically ask is, and you know, it's very routine for me, is asking if you're sexually active, and then simply are you having any sexual health concerns that you would like to discuss with me? And I would encourage um, those of you that you are listening to come up with your own language, but to try in some point in your review of systems or wherever it's most comfortable for you in your um, uh, patient visit to at least just ask. Now Karen um, came to see me for the first time in February, I think it was, as a sexual health consult. So when she was scheduled, I already knew she had a sexual um, health complaint, so I was beyond this point in the algorithm. Um, but again, just trying to start at the beginning um, uh, is really just to ask. So Karen, I'd like you to talk a little bit, if you can, uh, then about um, how you got to my office and you know your check-in process and kind of what happened um, when you got here. Okay. Um. Well, as I mentioned before, you know, I had been suffering like two or three years, and I felt like my gynecologist, she just didn't, you know, take my concerns seriously. And um, it was, you know, about four months ago, I, I think I just really became desperate. Um, so I was nervous about my first visit. I got lost on the way here, actually, but when I did find the office, I was really happy to see how small and personal it was. It was really comfortable, too. Um, the staff was really friendly, and I didn't wait long to you know, be brought back into the exam room. And Karen, were you given anything when you came into the exam room? Oh, uh, yes. I was asked to fill out a couple of forms. Um, it asked me about my period, menopause, and a separate form about sexual health. Great. Um, so what you see on the screen here is what we call the DSDS, or the Decreased Sexual Desire Screener. Um, and again, remember, so this is um, a separate consultative visit that I was seeing Karen about. And what I do for women who come to see me for a consultation is um, all patients, when we check them in for the first time, will get a menopause questionnaire as well as the DSDS. Um, and this is a very important questionnaire, and I, again, use it in practice on a regular basis, which has five simple questions that patients are asked to uh, report on on their own. And in evaluating a woman who has low desire, this is very helpful. So you can see here that the four first questions are, in the past, was your level of sexual desire or interest good and satisfying to you, right? So this is getting to the point that someone who's presenting with low desire had normal desire or what was normal for them in the past. Um, and that there's been a change. This isn't someone who's had a lifetime of no desire. And then the next question is, has there been a decrease? And of course, we, in someone with low desire, they would answer yes. 
And then are you bothered by it? Because again, the hallmark of female sexual dysfunction is having a complaint but being bothered by it. And then would you like your level of sexual desire to increase? And so the answer to one to four, if we're screening for HSDD, should be yes. And then five is really to exclude other things that, or at least raise the point that there might be other things that are contributing. So in someone who um, ha says no to all of these things, so it's not related to another medical condition or depression, it's not related to meds, pregnancy, other uh, factors related to sexual health, your partner's sexual problems, a relationship issue, or stress and fatigue, then that would lead more towards a biologic basis of their low desire. But again, this also helps the clinician, and, and if you use this in practice, um, really focus then some questions uh, when you're talking to your patient. So Karen, um, let's role play a little bit. So obviously this first visit that we had was many months ago now, but can you um, go into a little bit more detail, if you can, about really what you experienced and other things that were going on in your relationship as you were noticing that your desire was less? Okay, um, sure. Well, as I said before, you know, I always had a great libido. Um, really enjoyed sex and I often initiate it, but like I said, about three years ago, I don't know why I just stopped. I mean, it wasn't even a thought in my day-to-day -to, -day to even think about sex or, you know, and I did notice that uh, there was a lot of tension the big source of tension in my household because, you know, I would only want to, you know, have sex when when he wanted it and, you know, I was trying to make him happy, but, you know, my husband knows me well and, you know, he knew the difference, um, you know, but it's really frustrating because um, I feel like, you know, we're not as connected like we used to be, like something was missing and I know he feels it too, um, so I was starting to feel really down about it and I just really, really wanted to fix it. And Karen, just tell me a little bit, I mean, do you, um, you, it sounds like you feel like you have good communication and that your relationship is strong. I mean, is it, and how is this impacting that? Or it is. I mean, you know, we're good. We, we're pretty happy. You know, we share a lot. We, we're good. It's just that it feels like um, we don't have that connection anymore. And, um, you know, I don't like arguing with him or anything. I, you know, will rather ignore or just, you know, go to sleep when after he goes to sleep just to not be around him. So I didn't want to, you know, just initiate it. I didn't want to be bothered by it, period. So it sounds like you were even having some behavior changes or avoiding him a little bit, um, even just so you weren't in the situation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. I think that gives a good description. Um, what I want to talk about for a moment is, um, before we go on to Karen a little bit, is, you know, Karen, I think, uh, presented a really good history of something that she felt was the problem, which was really desire only. The only thing that she brought up that you just heard, and when she came to see me in February, was really that this was a desire disorder. Um, but what we know about female sexual dysfunction is that there's many things that over lap. And what I think this slide does a good job of uh, pictorially showing is that arousal disorders and pain and orgasmic disorders, and they all can be interrelated. And so anytime that you're evaluating a patient who is complaining of desire, you, a desire issue, you really need to evaluate other aspects of their sexual health and really make sure you're taking a complete sexual history because it is more complicated often and you often will discover that maybe they are in fact having pain, for example, and pain, uh, if they're having pain with sex, that can really impact their desire. And so really it takes, um, again, some questioning in the history to kind of tease that out. And so I'll ask Karen, Karen, do you think, um, you know, how, how were other aspects of your um, sexual health? Were you having any pain? Did you have normal arousal? No, everything is fine in those departments. Um, there's no pain and I orgasm okay. Um, it's good while we're doing it, but it still doesn't change the fact that I'm just not interested the next time. Okay. And so tell me a little bit more, Karen, then about, um, you know, what was going on at home during this time. I mean, so you said it started uh, two or three years ago. I mean, was anything going on with your children or at work or with your marriage or parents or anything in your life that you think you could tie to the change in your desire? 
Well, you know, life in general is stressful, you know, having three kids and working and but everything was really good. You know, I take care of my uh my parents, you know, for a long time now and um you know, we're pretty happy and I just don't think there's anything out of the ordinary. We have a pretty active social life, you know. Um, so nothing that I can think of. But like I said, about two or three years ago, I just haven't had any desire to want to have sex. And it's not a, you know, a thought in my day-to-day. -day. I'm just, I don't know. I'm, you know, my husband and I, were pretty happy. You know, he's an amazing guy. And it's truly frustrating to both of us to feel this way or, you know, maybe not feel this way, if that makes sense. So um, when Karen came to see me in February and what I think you're hearing that she's describing now is that she really doesn't describe, and I didn't get this uh, on that first visit, that her relationship was really in trouble or that there was anything that was out of the ordinary in terms of her level of stress or that her mood, she, that she wasn't unusually uh, anxious or depressed. And I think, Karen, you would agree with that, right? And that's right. what you're describing now, that you, at the time, uh, you didn't really feel like that was what the issue was. Is that correct? That's right. And I would say that, you know, although I'm not a sex therapist, um, and maybe Karen can uh, validate this, is that I really do try on that first initial consult to spend enough time with the patient to really tease out whether or not there's things um, in her life that are contributing to the low desire. And that's really important because in the models of female sexual uh, function, uh, and response, we know that the psychosocial components really uh, play a big role. And in Karen's case, I just didn't have a sense um, that there was uh, a lot going on. And I did try to tease that out with her. So in addition to kind of taking the uh, psychosocial history, it's really important with um, patients that you do a complete history in terms of past medical history, surgical history, and obstetrical history um, to really um, tease out um, other things that could be contributing to low desire. So Karen, can you tell us a little bit about your past medical history and your past OB history and what was going on with your periods uh, when you came to see me? Uh, sure. So um, I guess about two years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, hypertension. Um, I don't have any cert history of surgeries. We have three healthy vaginal deliveries. Um, and my periods are they're normal. They're monthly. They're almost like clockwork. And are you having any symptoms, or were you in February having any symptoms of any kind of changes, any irregularity in your periods, any change in your bleeding pattern, any intermittent hot flashes, any vaginal dryness, anything that would suggest uh, what your gynecologist suggested, which is that you were perimenopausal? No, and that's what was really frustrating because she just told me this was normal, and I didn't have any of those symptoms, so I felt like this was completely not normal. For me. Okay, great. And so as part of the history again, um, you know, I go on from there to really talk about medications. And um, in Karen's case, uh, she was taking lisinopril, um, and she'd been on that for several years. And um, lisinopril, although some blood pressure medicines clearly can impact sexual health, uh, the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs really don't seem to have much impact on sexual health. Um, it's commonly beta blockers um, and clonidine that do. Um, if you reference back the paper that I mentioned, the HSDD paper, there's a really good table in there of medications that can impact sexual health. And in primary care practices, the things that we commonly see um, that patients are on are all of the antidepressants um, and uh, oral contraceptives. And those are probably the two most common to be aware of. And um, certainly in my practice, although Karen uh, was not on uh, oral contraceptives or an antidepressant, those are one of the drugs that I will identify as I'm going through the history as possibly something that I could make a change in um, that might positively impact desire. But in Karen's case, um, lisinopril, I was not all that concerned about in terms of impacting her low desire um, and that she'd been stable on that uh, for um, a number of years. Um, Social history is really important um, to take as well. Uh, certainly we know that alcohol, sleep, diet, exercise, all of those things can impact um, uh, uh, desire and sexual health. So Karen, can you tell me a little bit about your lifestyle habits and yeah, sure. what goes on at home? Um, I don't smoke, 
I maybe have a drink about once or twice a month. And I do admit that my diet is horrible. You know, we eat a lot of fast food, um, and I can't even think about having fun, finding time to exercise. Um, but it's tough to manage, you know, three kids and the sports and stuff and our busy life. Um, I'm sleeping just fine, trying to get, you know, at least seven to eight hours a night, but that is not always possible. <laughs> right. And so, Karen, most of the time you feel that you get enough sleep, you don't wake up exhausted, you're not chronically exhausted, you wouldn't say? No, not at all. I, don't, I feel well rested when I wake up in the morning, you know, and throughout the day, you know, I don't feel like, you know, I'm, I'm coming down or fatigue or anything like that. And that, that is a point I would just like to make is that I really um, would encourage listeners to just really ask about sleep because certainly uh, chronic fatigue and chronic sleep disruption can really impact desire and certainly addressing that can be helpful if you're talking to a woman about improving um, her desire. So um, following a good history, and I think, Karen, what would you say? How much time do you think I spent with um, you on that history part of that? I was really impressed. It was at least 30 minutes, you know. You had talked to me about, you know, my history, my personal history, my family, my husband, you know, you asked about my marriage, our kids, um, you know, if I had any like health issues or concerns, diet and exercise and any past traumas, um, you made me feel really comfortable talking to you, and um, I, I appreciate it. Well, and, and thank you, Karen. But, um, you know, again, um, I realize um, for listeners that I have the leisure of having 60 minutes and really um, have designed the practice to provide 60 minutes because I think, again, I'm not a sex therapist, but as an internist doing sexual medicine, you still really need enough time to do an adequate history um, and really tease out what's going on with um, the patient. The other thing is a physical exam is really important, um, and important for many reasons, um, really to assess whether or not there's other uh, internal medicine health issues going on. And you can see I'm telling you that Karen's blood pressure was normal on her lisinopril here, but really to do um, a complete gynecologic exam. And the reason for that is, just as I showed you the, the image where the circles interrelate about all of the different aspects of sexual function that can be interrelated is, you want to make sure, even though she's complaining of low desire, that there's nothing else going on. And so a complete GYN exam to exclude clitoral adhesions or phimosis, uh, vulvodynia, um, high tone pelvic floor dysfunction, uh, skin disorders, or uh, genitourinary syndrome of atrophy, or vaginal infection, vaginitis. Um, and although I didn't really have a strong history, uh, get the history from Karen that she was having one of those problems, um, I really did an exam for her and it was completely normal, which was reassuring. So. After a history and physical, um, what I do in my practice is I ask the patients to dress. Um, I leave the room. I use my five minutes um, to review their health questionnaires that we collected uh, when we had checked them in, including the DSDS, and I start to formulate in my head my management plan. And once the patient's dressed, I go back to the exam room. And again, I really try to spend some time um, discussing my thoughts about a potential diagnosis and a management plan with the patient. And so with Karen, I hope that um, you've gotten the flavor in the same way that I did when she came in in February, that she does meet criteria for generalized acquired hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And in her case, as I told you, I spent a lot of time trying to tease out whether or not she had any issues in her relationship or there was any mood disturbance or there was any sleep disturbance or something that was really contributing. And I really didn't get that sense from her. I really had the sense that she really did seem to have a biologic basis, at least as the predominant factor in her low desire, um, and that this was something potentially that we could help her uh, with. Um, I also should note that I use EPIC as my electronic health platform, uh, which I love um, because I have access to records from across the country for patients that come to see me. Um, I also have access to the Internet. And the way that I've set up my exam room is I have a small consultation table in the middle of the room with a large monitor that I'm using for my EPIC. And I have the patient pull up a chair right next to me, and I do a lot of stuff 
on the computer screen by pulling up images and educational materials. And I've worked to create several dot phrases related to sexual health that I often incorporate into the patient's after visit summary so that when they get their after visit summary, there's some information about what we talked about um, printed in there. Um, I also have um, uh, a small retail portion of the practice, which includes um, uh, books and resources that I have available in my office that I will often um, recommend. And certainly, you know, I, I talk to Karen about some of those things. Um, and so when I went back in the room, I really um, spent some time with Karen uh, going through uh, and educating her about uh, what I thought. And this is um, the biopsychosocial model of female sexual response. And this is my favorite uh, model of female sexual response, although it's by no means the only model. And the reason that I like this, and I actually pull this up for patients all the time, um, is because I think this picture explains to patients um, uh, and is very helpful um, in terms of what's going on. And so the way that I explain it is there are these four interrelated circles, and you can see here that biology is only one of them. The other three really have to do with all of those other things I was trying to tease out in practice, right? So whether or not there's anxiety or depression, whether or not the relationship is um, healthy if there's life stressors that are going on, whether or not there's any past history of abuse or cultural issues that are leading to low desire, um, and really work through that in the, in the um, visit. And again, as I mentioned, I didn't really have the flavor with Karen than any of those other things were really contributing. But I think it's helpful for the patient to see why we talk about all of those other things, and that really biology is one piece of this. And again, as I said, you know, I think in Karen's case, um, biology was largely playing into this, at least that was my sense, but it's not the only thing. And so even though when I discussed this with Karen in the room, I told her that I thought biology was really a portion of this, I also talked about some of the other things that we know happens, um, that after a long duration marriage, even if the marriage is good, that boredom can contribute to low desire, that potentially there were opportunities to work to spice things up in the bedroom a little bit. Uh, we talked about trying to be more planful with sex, being more planful with a date night with her husband. We talked about mindfulness during sexual activities. Um, and truthfully, I also talked to her about looking to get more exercise and improve her diet a little bit. But even though we talked about all of those things, um, you know, I still really had the sense that largely biology, what was going on with, uh, for her. Now, in patients other than Karen, um, you know, as I've said a couple times, I'm not a ASEC certified sex therapist, and so what my level of training is in the office is not all that great. I'm not a sex therapist. Um, I'm lucky enough in um, my community to have some excellent sex therapists that I refer to. Um, and the data is really um, very strong that cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness therapy can be very helpful for patients. And so if in a patient other than Karen, where I have more of a sense that there are relationship issues um, that are contributing, I will refer to sex, a sex therapist in my community. Um, but Karen, I really thought it was biology. And so um, this is a slide from that algorithm from that HSDD paper that I've referenced a couple times just to explain what I'm going through here, which is really to look at potential, potential biopsychosocial factors um, that we could modify. And that goes back to what I was discussing with Karen about potentially making uh, more time in her relationship for a date night um, and working at ways to spice things up. So the next thing I did with Karen was really spend some time talking to her about the biology and what we really know about low desire. And as I said, I use images on this computer screen in my office all the time. And I will pull up images like this, um, which really um, are published uh, in uh, peer-reviewed medical journals and really show if you look at PET scans in a healthy uh, woman who has normal desire, um, that the areas of brain activity are different than they are in uh, women with low desire. And for women, I find these images really helpful to say, you know, this, there is something going on. This is real, um, there, and this is potentially something that we can help um, treat you. The other thing that I talk about a lot is um, this model of uh, a balance of excitatory factors and inhibitory factors. So this is something called the uh, dual control model. And you can see here that 
in uh, both the green box and the red, the upper ones on the right and left, there's a whole host of neurotransmitters. And we know that some of the brain neurotransmitters, uh, specifically dopamine and norepinephrine, um, are really excitatory neurotransmitters, whereas serotonin is really inhibitory. And so when I talk to women about that, the, the PET scan and activity in varying parts of the brain, I also will talk to her about neurotransmitters, and that really what we think um, in HSDD is that there's an imbalance in excitatory neurotransmitters and inhibitory neurotransmitters. And when we think about treatment, what we're trying to do is get the, the seesaw to tip towards excitation. And that can be through um, psycho social, interpersonal relationship changes that you can make, um, but it also can be uh, by shifting the balance of neurotransmitters. Um, and so again, trying to educate them on why we think these medications um, may help. So in terms of Karen, uh, what we did then after educating her a little bit, um, I really talked about developing a management plan. And as I mentioned, I did talk about books and some um, you know, behavioral things to do as part of it. Um, but in her case, I really wanted to spend time discussing about medication options. Um, I should mention that for all new patients, um, I will do laboratory studies, and that will include uh, a regular metabolic profile that includes a glucose, uh, thyroid function, prolactin, um, and hormone levels, which include estradiol, progesterone, uh, a total testosterone, and sex hormone binding globulin. And then I use the total T and sex hormone binding globulin with the online ISSM testosterone calculator to calculate a woman's free T level. Um, and that's really what I do as um, pretty standard for um, a new patient like Karen who comes with low desire. So if we go back to this algorithm, and this is the lower part uh, of the algorithm, um, and you can see here that we've identified Karen um, as meeting criteria for uh, generalized acquired hypoactive sexual desire disorder. We've spent some time educating her. She is premenopausal, and now we're really looking at sex therapy or CNS agents as next steps for treatment. And in her case, um, you know, as we talked, I, I didn't really have the flavor that sex therapy uh, was going to be the primary uh, thing that was going to benefit her, and we really started to focus on available medications. What's currently available uh, right now, uh, phlebanserin is the only currently FDA-approved option, um, although bremelanotide is coming up the pipeline. Um, certainly for years uh, before phlebanserin was approved, we were using off-label medications, uh, most commonly bupropion and buspirone. Um, and I will tell you, uh, in the years prior to phlebanserin, I used these quite frequently, and in some patients they had some modest benefit. Um, certainly off-label testosterone, uh, either using a dose-appropriate male product or compounded product, um, is another uh, option that we do use in some patients with HSDD. And I talked to Karen a little bit about all of these things um, as we moved forward with her visit. So let me tell you a little bit more about uh, phlebanserin. Um, so phlebanserin was approved in 2015, and it is uh, the first and only currently available treatment for HSDD. HSDD in premenopausal women, um, and it's HSDD that we're convinced is not being caused by relationship issues, medication, or other medical issues. And in Karen's case, as I've said many times, I really did feel that there was a biologic basis and her relationship was not contributing. Um, it acts on the brain, um, on the neurotransmitters, on that balance of excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters that we think are associated with desire. Um, it's a mixed serotonin agonist and antagonist. It's an oral medication that's taken at bedtime and it's taken daily. It's not an on-demand medication. And it does have side effects, side effects that have gotten a lot of play in the, in the media um, that include most commonly dizziness, sleepiness, and nausea. What we know from the clinical trials uh, that led to approval are that approximately 40 to 50% of women with HSDD who take phlebanserin will respond with a meaningful increase in sexual desire and number of sexually satisfying events. Um, and I certainly have had patients and have patients on this medication where it has been um, helpful. 
But the side effects are really what has gotten a great deal of play, as I mentioned, in the media. Um, and I just want to talk about that a little bit. So as a primary care provider who's been in practice for a very long time now, I prescribe a lot of antidepressants in my practice. And, you know, centrally nervous system acting medications, um, I use a lot. I'm very comfortable with in practice. Um, and when you look at the side effect profile of phlebanserin compared to some of those medications, they really look similar. And so for me as a practitioner, the side effect profile, although you can see there that both uh, dizziness, sleepiness, nausea, and fatigue were certainly above placebo in the pivotal trials and in the range of 9 to 11%, um, that isn't so different than what I see with other antidepressants um, that I use very commonly. But there are a few specific things to remember about flibanserin. Um, clinicians and pharmacies must be certified to prescribe through the REMS program. And although that sounds daunting, in fact, it actually is not a big deal. For clinicians to be certified, there's a website that you go to, you review some slides, you answer some questions, and you get a REMS certification number. And most pharmacies, at least in my area, are in fact REMS certified. I think the big thing and what um, uh, many times for patients in my practice and trying to talk to them about this medication is the alcohol contraindication. It is contraindication. There's a boxed warning in the, um, in the uh, PI, um, and patients really must abstain from alcohol while taking it. It's also contraindicated with specific drugs, specifically HIV drugs, fluconazole, certain antibiotics, and calcium channel blockers. Uh, and these, that's because these drugs are moderate to strong CYP3A4 inhibitors. Um, I should mention that oral contraceptives are weak CYP3A4 inhibitors. It's not a contraindication. Um, and we do still use phlebanserin cautiously with OCPs. So as I told you, I, I did talk uh, to Karen um, when I went back in the room with her about phlebanserin, but I also went through testosterone with her just to explain um, my bias that she was actually a better candidate for phlebanserin to try than for testosterone. Um, so what we know about testosterone um, is that there are categories of patients who have low desire where there, there is randomized controlled trial data that suggests that it's effective. Um, and those categories of women include surgically menopausal women uh, who are on estrogen, naturally postmenopausal women on hormone therapy, postmenopausal women on no treatment, uh, antidepressant uh, treated patients who have low desire. And then the one I've boxed in the black on the left are women in the late perimenopause transition. So again, there is data about testosterone use in that group, um, but you'll recall that Karen really gave me no flavor that she was in the perimenopause transition. There is no blood test to confirm you're in the perimenopause transition, but her, her reproductive history of having normal, regular menses did not suggest to me that she was perimenopausal. And so I was not so convinced that testosterone would be beneficial for her. And there really is no uh, controlled data for testosterone use in premenopausal uh, women in terms of desire. And so this was something that I, I, I kind of uh, led Karen away from, um, although I will tell you that it would not be an absolute contraindication for me depending on her response to phlebanserin. But um, again, the data really does not support use in premenopausal women. And before I let Karen come back, and I do want her to talk a little bit more, um, I think this is, again, a really um, helpful pictorial um, to just explain what we think we're doing with treatment, um, which really, um, in this model of having too many inhibitory factors and too few excitatory factors, what we do with treatment, and the treatment can be education, it can be modification of things like stopping oral contraceptives or changing an antidepressant, it can be sex therapy, it can be hormones, or it can be phlebanserin, uh, you know, a centrally nervous system acting agent, which is really when we're rebalancing this excitation uh, in inhibitory factors, hoping to get more excitation, which will lead to increased desire. And so finally, back to Karen. So, um, you know, Karen, what we were role playing with is her visit that she came to see me um, in February. Um, Karen came back to see me in April, and um, we're currently in July. So I think, Karen, it's been, I don't know, three or four months since your first visit. Um, and I'd like, to tell, I'd like you to tell me a little bit about um, kind of your experience, what happened in the office 
um, on that first visit that I saw you and what's kind of happened since then and how are you doing and what's been happening? Okay. Um, well, first, you really did help me understand that I wasn't crazy and that there was a possible reason that my desire, you know, was low or had gone. Um, I remember, you know, everything that you pulled up on the computer about the brain scans and, you know, you explained how complex sexual health from men to women is. Um, I remember the labs that you drew from me and you actually ended up explaining every last one because I don't like getting my blood drawn. Um, and, you know, you explained also that, you know, as we get older, you know, our testosterone levels go down, they change. Um, you went over some treatment options for medication and you definitely told me about Flavanserin and I already told you I heard it was called the, you know, pink Viagra. Um, but you explained that it didn't work like regular Viagra, it doesn't affect blood flow, and it's not something that you would take um, only for sex. And, you know, I really thought that that was the best option for me. Um, we discussed side effects, you know, alcohol usage, um, which was really no big deal for me because, you know, I, you had me sign the waiver um, that I took to the pharmacist for the prescription. You know, I was really excited to try it. And, and tell me how your experience was when you started. Okay, so um, I have been on Clobanserin since about March, and it took a little while for me to get the prescription filled, um, but I am taking it every night like you suggested. Um, Did you have any side effects when you started? No, at first I really was worried about having side effects, you know, because of my blood pressure medication. I thought I would feel terrible, but no, I don't have any nausea, you know, I'm, I'm sleeping okay, I don't have any lightheadedness. I haven't noticed anything different. And, and when do you think you noticed anything? So I actually have. <laughs> I definitely noticed that, you know, desirable thoughts are back again. Um, I don't avoid my husband. <laughs> And it's good. Um, you know, I'm not where I used to be, but I can definitely tell there is a difference. I, I really can tell there's a difference. And have you had any side effects? You, you say no. Nothing. No, no. Al you know, no, not drink. I haven't drank any alcohol, um, but it was never a big deal for me or anything like that. Um, no, no side effects that I can tell. I, I think that the only good side effect that came from me taking, you know, was coming to see you and taking this medication because I definitely feel like I am getting back on the road to where I want to be, where we need to be. And tell me about your relationship. I mean, has your husband noticed? Um, oh, he's noticed. Um, he has, you know, he's happy for me. You know, he's a huge support for me. Um, but, you know, just like me, you know, we were feeling down because we thought that this was something that we had to live with. This is something that our, you know, our, this is how our life was going to be. You know, no one wants to be unhappy like that, and no one should be. So, and so is your thought you're going to continue? Oh, definitely. <laughs> yes, I am going to continue taking flibanserin. Great. Well, Karen, Karen is lovely, as you can all tell. Um, thank you for your time and coming and sharing all of this with us today, and I hope it's been helpful um, to the listeners. Um, in summary, uh, Karen, um, I think, clearly presented the picture of what I believe she has, which is generalized acquired hypoactive sexual desire disorder. She's premenopausal. Um, she has a strong and connected marriage with good communication. Um, after a complete evaluation, um, I really believe that she had a biologic basis for her low desire to a large extent. Um, she was willing to give up alcohol, and the good news is she seems to be in the category of women who has responded to the medication and has tolerated it very, very well with no side effects um, and has noted an improvement in her desire. Um, and so when I saw her back at eight weeks, she was doing well. Um, and after that eight-week uh, visit, I typically see people at six months um, and go from there. Um, and I hope she continues to do well, and I will see her in a couple months. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about hypoactive sexual desire disorder today. Um, I hope it's been helpful. Um, for those of you listening that don't think that you are comfortable 
with the complete evaluation. I hope that my point um, of just trying to figure out a way to ask about sexual health in your review of systems um, and making a referral for women that have sexual health complaints um, is a huge step forward and will be helpful even if uh, prescribing phlebanserin uh, or thinking of uh, prescribing testosterone or other options is not something that you feel expert enough uh, to do. Um, asking is really the most important first step. So with that, I'll end. Thank you again uh, for allowing me to talk to you today about HSDD.